Hello. So, Robert Louis Stevenson Literary Networks and Transatlantic Publishing, in the 1890 preferred title, but subtitle The Author Incorporated, is really in a way a companion monograph to my book on Robert Louis Stevenson and Theories of Reading. That book looked very much at abstract uh, ideas of readership, how reading and pleasure worked for Stevenson, how he thought about it, how he played it out in his text, and how his ideas on reading anticipated in some ways um, later very sophisticated concepts of, of what happens when we read. This book is in a way much less abstract and much more focused on the material cultures around Stevenson. The book began when I was researching material in the Scribner's Archive in Princeton for the scholarly edition of Stevenson's last novel, St Ives, that I'm currently completing for Edinburgh University Press for the new Edinburgh edition. St Ives is, is a fascinating text left unfinished at Stevenson's death, really neglected when his other unfinished novel, Weir of Hermiston, uh, was fetid. And a text that, like Weir of Hermiston, produced a huge amount of correspondence in the Scribner's archive as people across the globe fought over, argued, negotiated what to do with the latest work of Stevenson, um, who by the time of the 1890s was living in Samoa and very far removed from metropolitan networks and centres of publishing. I got more and more fascinated with the conversations and the arguments that were going on in these archives. And I returned to Princeton with the support of a Friends of Princeton Library grant to do work on this book specifically. And I suppose when I began the book, I was thinking it would be primarily text-based. It would be talking about St. Eyes, it would be talking about Weir of Hermiston, it would be talking about Stevenson's last years. But in a way, it's become much more about the characters around Stevenson. And their very different perceptions of Stevenson as an author, their very different engagements with him as an author. And also how those engagements with him continued in Stevenson's afterlife. So as I say, it became a book that was much more about materiality, about money, but also ideas of what it means to be an author. And of course, the idea of what it means to be an author was changing quite dramatically in the 1890s. So rather to my surprise, it became in a way a character-based study. And the first character that I look at in the book, and he certainly was a character, is Lemuel Bangs, known affectionately as the Senator. Lemuel Bangs was Scribner's uh, literary representative in London for about 30 years, and a figure who fashioned a very particular identity for himself, um, drinking pink champagne at the Savoy every day, networking, and week after week, writing a very careful, unemotional eight-page letter back to his employers in New York. So Lemuel Bang's letters and his opinions, which are never articulated very strongly, offer a fascinating insight into the kinds of concerns that publishers at the time had, and not just publishers generally, but his letters reveal divisions between perceptions of, of British publishers and American publishers. He was right at the nexus of these kinds of intersections. <laughs> 
The second figure I look at is someone who really became the bane of Lemuel Bang's life, Charles Baxter, Stevenson's boyhood friend, um, fellow uh, member of the speculative club when they were at college in Edinburgh, and a figure who latterly took it upon himself to act not just as Stevenson's lawyer, but really what we would now call his literary agent. And the way in which Charles Baxter behaved, uh, his very strong opinions, caused all kinds of problems for American publishers, particularly those who felt they'd had a long, loyal, established relationship with Stevenson. During the last years of Stevenson's life and after his death, Charles Baxter's preferred method of dealing with, with publishers and trying to get a good deal for the Stevenson family was more or less to auction off Stevenson's books to the highest bidder, which certainly was not normal practice in old established firms like um, Scribner's. So Charles Baxter is a dynamic, unpredictable, rumbustious character who did what he thought um, was the best thing to protect Stevenson's interests. In the correspondence, both at Scribner's and elsewhere, he emerges as a very marked contrast to Stevenson's other mentor, Sidney Colvin. In the last years of his life, when he really didn't want anything more to do with publishers and financial negotiations, Stevenson divided um, responsibility for his writing between Charles Baxter and Sidney Colvin with the understanding that Baxter has nothing to do with the proofs and Colvin has nothing to do with the business. I think perhaps Charles Baxter came, uh, followed his side of the bargain rather more than Sidney Colvin. Sidney Colvin was fondly called by the Stevenson family um, the custodian and the monument. And in the chapter on Colvin, I look at the way in which this very reticent, dry, walled-in self sought to control and curate Stevenson's work in ways that he thought was best. Colvin is in many ways a deeply irritating figure. He cannot let anything go without editing. But the more I looked at his writing, the more I felt there was an emotional um, identification with Stevenson. Stevenson, in a way, was living the life that Colvin never could. And in this chapter, I look at the way in which Colvin curated not just Stevenson's works during his last years and after his death, but also in terms of preserving his reputation and biography. The next chapter, in a way, is very different in that it's less character-based and looks at family, friends and collaborators, that small community living with Stevenson in Samoa. And while both Charles Baxter and Sidney Colvin worked enormously hard to preserve the idea of the unique and great single author and the ownership of great works, this little community worked in very different ways. And looking at the dynamics of this community, it's quite interesting to speculate where they might have taken his work. Fanny van der Grift Stevenson, Lloyd Osborne, Bell Strong, all had their very particular ideas on what Stevenson's writing should be, all felt a certain amount of investment and appropriation of it. And their interest in the American market in popular fiction might have moved his work in new and surprising um, directions. Who can tell? And in the chapter on 
family, friends and collaborators, I also look at the way in which that group worked, again, often at odds with Sidney Colvin, to preserve Stevenson's work and reputation after his death, offering a very different reading of what that might mean. The chapter on Arthur Quiller Coach extends in time rather further. Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch is of interest in this book because he is the person who was tasked with finishing St Ives. He wrote the last six chapters, working out the plot as he went along, finding it, as he said later, an absolutely miserable business. He was, in a way, a very good choice for finishing that novel. He had made his name writing Stevensonian adventure fiction. He loved Stevenson. When Stevenson died, he mourned his absence, writing that, that until that moment, the, the quivering needle of writers across the world had been directed towards Samoa. So in this chapter, I look at the ways in which Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch's early writing emulated Stevenson. I look at the whole business of the conclusion, but I also look at the way in which some of the notions around style, around adventuring, around writing were played out in Quiller Cooch's later and very different contribution to literature, setting up um, English literature as a university subject and fighting for a version of reading and pleasure that I think we might recognise as shaded by Stevenson. The final chapter looks at someone who again was shaded and shadowed by Stevenson throughout his life. The poet, an aesthete, critic and uh, dandy, I suppose, Richard Le Gallienne, the boy from Birkenhead, who was initially hugely influenced by Oscar Wilde and, as you can see, rather emulated his style, but also was deeply saddened by Stevenson's death and felt a huge loss, a huge loss personally and a huge loss to the world of literature. So in this chapter I look at the way in which Stevenson spoke to a rather different constituency in the 1890s and beyond and the way in which he prompted in Le Gallienne really interesting debates about writing for pleasure, writing for money, writing for aesthetic satisfaction. And I trace Le Gallienne's ongoing relationship with Stevenson right through to his last years in America, where he tries to write a version of Treasure Island. The book explores this network of figures who took on part of Stevenson's authorial persona, who invested in that persona, who adapted and who appropriated it, who incorporated it in financial senses, but who also incorporated Stevenson and what they thought he stood for emotionally, intellectually and in literary terms. And that's why for the cover of the book I chose this wonderful image by Graham Percy from his Imagine's History series. I'm very grateful to the National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh and to his um, partner for letting me use this image, which in a way demonstrates the incorporation of Stevenson, passing over a global landscape, having a voice, but also being carried along by a face 
and a presence that both is and is not quite himself.